All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is our teaching and learning call for July 22nd, 2021. And I'm Wilma Hodges. I'll be facilitating today. Um, the link to the agenda and notes in Etherpad is in the chat. So if you've not already gone to that link and signed in, please do. Um, and uh, as usual, we'll start off with a few announcements. But before we do that, um, I see that Patrick is here. So Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself to folks? Hi, everyone. I was uh, just stumbling my way through the chat feature here. I was uh, Jennifer, I apologize, uh, using Jen. I was just literally texting someone named Jen, so I carried over there. Um, I'm Patrick Masson. I'm the, uh, as of two weeks ago, the interim executive director for Aperio. Um, and uh, I've, I've spoken with Wilma uh, a bit about the Sakai community, and she was kind enough to invite me here. So hopefully I'm not intruding. I'll just be quiet and sit in the back and hopefully not bother anyone. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm excited to meet everyone and learn more about how everyone's uh, using Sakai. Well, you're certainly very welcome to be here and you don't have to just lurk. Feel free to interact if, if there's anything you'd like to um, bring to the group. Um, so we're very happy to have you and we're excited to have you as our new interim um, executive director. So welcome. Um, okay, so just a quick few couple of announcements. Um, the Sakai PMC quarterly meeting, um, which is also open to the community, that's tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we're going to be meeting in um, a period of Big Blue Button Room 4. So um, 10 a.m. tomorrow if you're available. And this is our quarterly meeting where we kind of do just um, some strategic updates. We're going to be talking about the PMC election results, um, a little bit of budget work, and other topics um, that people bring up. So if you'd like to take a look at the tentative agenda, you can follow that link there. Um, and... Uh, if there's something that you would like to bring up at the meeting, feel free to add it to the agenda. So um, the other announcement is that I'm gonna be doing some Sakai 21 lunch and learn sessions in August. Um, so they're gonna run from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna do them kind of three consecutive weeks. So August 6th, 13th, and 20th. Um, the first one is gonna be on dark theme and dashboard. Um, the second one's going to be on new features in Gradebook and Lessons. And the final one is going to be new features on rubrics and, and LTI. Um, we've done a few presentations on the new stuff in 21 already. So if you've caught one of those, you may have seen kind of the overview. What I'm planning to do in these is kind of dive a little bit deeper into the new features and answer more questions about them. So hopefully, even if you've seen one of those other presentations, this will still have some new stuff for you. So we plan to build in a good amount of time for questions in case people want to know how to implement and on their campus. So um, does anyone else have any uh, announcements? Hey, Wilma, should we do a quick round of introductions for Patrick's benefit? Um, sure. Yeah, he introduced himself, but I neglected to have other folks introduce themselves. Yeah, I was, I was thinking great, of the rest of us. Great. I mean, like, he knows you and me, yeah. but maybe some of the other names. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Josh. Thanks. Um, so I think everybody knows me already. So, <laughs> Josh, would you like to go next? Sure. I think I'm everybody Josh knows Wilson. you, too. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows who you know. You know, as Martin says, I need no introduction. <laughs> Josh Wilson from Longsight. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it would be great for Patrick to kind of put names with voices and institutions for everyone else who's in the room. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just kind of go down the list there? Um, I see Adam first in my list. Adam, I don't know if you have a microphone. It looks like you're just connected with headphones. OK, um, Charles, do you want to do a quick intro? Sure, Charles Bristow. I'm at Illinois State University. Um, I'm actually the, the second uh, facilitator for this group. Um, I do faculty support for our instance of Sakai here at ISU. Thanks, Charles. Um, Christina? 
Hi, um, I'm Christina Schwiebert. I'm at Northwest State Community College, which is just a little school in Ohio. And I normally am hanging out with the JIRA triage and QA groups. Thanks, Christina. And it looks like Adam may be reconnected with the microphone. So Adam, would you like to do a quick introduction? Hi, my name is Adam Hauerwas. I am the LMS manager at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island, and I like hanging out at the teaching and learning groups. Great, thank you. Um, Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Laudiana. I'm from Walsh University, which is also in Ohio, about an hour south of Cleveland. And I am the LMS administrator, and I work with our e-learning group uh, collaboratively on all of our initiatives. Great, thank you. And uh, Jordy, and please forgive me if I mispronounced that. Hey, no problem. I'm Jordi Juarez. I'm a computer engineer from University of Lleida in Spain. Um, mainly, we give support to teachers and instructors about using Sakai, and um, we are been using Sakai maybe for 10 years. I'm not sure, but but maybe. And I'm working with my partner, Noemi Verdu, that I'm not sure because it's not here, but we, we, we support to this, this type of, of things to teachers and instructors. Great, thank you. And I think Michael is the only other person who has been introduced already. Cool, well, I'll jump right in then. Um, I'm Michael Green. I lead the Learning Technology Services and Strategy Team at Duke University. Um, Marty Supkoff, who you might see on calls, is our LMS lead, um, service lead for Sakai. Um, my role uh, is, is uh, more of an ecosystem uh, role, and LMS being a, a big part of that, of course. Um, and today I'm talking about some work that we've we've done. Yeah, so we um, we had a few JIRAs, I guess, lined up to um, to discuss, but first we're going to start off with the CK Editor improvements. Um, so that JIRA, let me just, it's in the Etherpad, but I'll paste it into the chat also if you want to open it up. That's the one that, um, that Michael is going to um, show us some, uh, or he's going to dem demonstrate some improvements for the CK Editor that are pretty exciting that he's been working on. Um, so I gave you presenter already, Michael, if you want to share your screen and take us through some of those. Yeah, let's uh, let's go for it. So we will share this one and yeah, I'll switch over to my local host. So I can't see the chat um, um, while I'm sharing, but I'm happy to come back to things. I'll try to switch back and forth. Um, um, if, if not, you're more than welcome to interrupt me by unmuting and asking a question or providing feedback. So um, yeah, I should have probably labeled this JIRA uh, updates. Uh, improvements is always a, uh, a, a risky word to use when you're introducing change. Um, but one of the big projects our team has been working on this summer is the conversations tool. Uh, and I'll probably do a little demo of that just so you could see the uh, CK editor changes. I'm going to start in announcements though. And as we were working on that project, I was looking at a lot of other tools, Slack, Gmail, uh, Microsoft Teams, Outlook, you know, a lot of, and their editors really stood out to me and, and how different their editors looked than ours. And so, uh, you know, we also got some feedback that, um, you know, people don't ever use the word CK editor because they don't know, but the CK editor is a core piece of the Sakai experience to them. And they would just, they would say things that I would correlate to, okay, the CK editor is actually what's causing a bad UX or it's making it feel outdated or something here. And so that that's, that's what, uh, that was the impetus for this work here. And it's a bunch of things. It's a, it's a library update. And I, I talked about this a little bit on the core team yesterday. And so I'm already splitting this out into multiple JIRAs so we can decide, you know, to take some and not all of it and whatnot. But one of the things is it's an update to CK Editor. And that actually allows us some interesting things because the latest version of CK Editor uh, comes with a lot of plugins that we used to have to add as external plugins previously. And so, uh, let me just create a new announcement and I'll just dive right on in here. So one of those things, you'll immediately notice a big change in, in the UI here. So uh, one of these things um, that has been around in CK Editor for a while is this idea of a toolbar can collapse config option. 
but out of the box it actually configs to uh, collapsing all of the toolbars away so you have no no options and I thought that was kind of uh, that didn't seem right to me so I've got this now working where it collapses to the top row of options and then if you open it up you would see however many more rows of icons you define so you could still define as many options as you wanted uh, but also kind of provide that nice um, lighter weight experience uh, we currently have a, a configuration in there for a, a basic toolbar which is what you would usually see on mobile but this would allow you to kind of have that nice lightweight feel but still add a wide variety of robust options for folks if, if you wanted so um, but some of the other plugins, right, are, are emojis, right? So we've had the Smiley plugin for a while, but now we've got a fully featured emoji picker, uh, just like all these other uh, apps do. Um, another one that's been big for us as we work on the Conversations project is 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 better LaTeX support. So we, you know, we've had the dollar sign, you know, um, LaTeX for a while now, and um, heard a couple of things. A faculty click that box in site info, they don't know what it does. They don't know how to use it. So there's definitely a communication issue we need to, to work on, uh, but it's just not apparent. So uh, so what? A, th this is another plugin. And, but they also told us that they wanted this kind of real time, you know, syntax checking, right? Like this updates uh, pretty real time. And then if I like, if I mess something up, it's really cool. It like, it gives me this nice red, um, like you, you've, got a, you've got a LaTeX error there. And so if I insert that, uh, you'll see how that looks compared. So these things work in tandem. That doesn't conflict with, with that at all. The other nice thing is that this is inline, right? Uh, and and, and th that works a lot better for you know trying to just weave these equations into your text in, in any of the tools, right? So um, another one I will quickly uh, demo, right? So like we'll just ignore this because that that's the Microsoft plugin I don't know if you're using that that's a Chrome add-on not actually a um... so let me select this I'm gonna make it a link really quick to uh, we'll just go to google.com and I've added this little uh, it's called a balloon toolbar in CK editor land and so anytime you select a link it now gives you three options the for these two are the same as in here and you know, edit this link remove the link but now I, I was surprised how hard it was to actually just visit the link I had just linked, right? I would have had to have edited the link, copy it out, and, and then and then go to it. So now, you know, I can just kind of one click and it takes me over to, to my link that I had to find, which I think is going to be really handy. Another thing that's nice is um, auto-linking, right? So now if I just paste... Paste that URL, it instantly links it and I don't have to select it and then you know, manually come in and, and, and create that link. So those are some things that CK Editor has um, out of the box now that we can just include in our build and configure. Um, I, I've done some adjustments to, in, to, to a couple of them, um, but most of them are just simply upgrade and turn them on. Um, what are some other things kind of that might be a good place to s stop and let me switch over to see if there's any chat comments here so I'm sorry for the matrix effect here okay so no chat so I I'll stay over here feel free to unmute ask questions uh, one thing you might notice I'll just kind of leave this bar here in addition to changing this to be one row I I was pretty um, heavy-handed in removing options um, I, I just I don't know. I mean, I could pull it up so you could see it side by side. It, we, we have a lot of options turned on in the default right now. And, and I don't have a great sense of how much they are used, but some of the feedback we were uh, in terms of, I don't have data right on, on how much each button is clicked, but the feedback we were getting this summer from some of our faculty was, I just get lost in there, right? I don't know what each of those buttons do and I just don't click any of them. That, that's kind of what they were telling us. So. Um, you know, I, I've removed quite a bit of them. They're all easy to add back. If you've never worked with this part of um, CK Editor, there, there's a file. There's a there's a file that that you edit, and it you can add any of the things back that I turned off. 
um, you could still have, you know, like I said earlier, five rows of toolbars here if you wanted to. So, um, but but I'll, I'll maybe pause there and let folks uh, chime in with some some kind of gut reactions to this because this is some of the first feedback from from TNL that I've I've gotten on this work. It's being quiet, giving other folks a chance to talk, but um, but I'll step in since everyone's collecting their thoughts. Um, I think it looks really great. I do like the simplified nature of it. Uh, it's a lot less overwhelming than the current toolbar, so I think that's definitely a, a win. Um, there are a couple buttons I'd like to see back, <laughs> but maybe that's just me. Um, the audio so recorder, audio the audio recorder, recorder and the the, the video. Um, insert uh, HTML5 video. But I don't know how often people use them. I just know that I demo them a lot because people always ask me, mm -hmm. um, can you record or can you add video? Mm -hmm. sure, and that's a good example where like my institution's needs might differ from from others because we have another service that we're trying to point people to. So I, yeah, I'm you guys to have Warpwire, so yeah. you don't really need those. But yeah, I'm I'm happy to add those back though. It's yep. Hey, Michael, is the is there easily findable and usable documentation for editing the file that you mentioned? I mean, I wonder like how much discovery you had to do to figure out how to do this. So I, I will say that I think CK Edit has pretty decent documentation. There, there's not Sakai documentation other than there are some documentation in the file itself for the Sakai specific things. But the vast majority of the stuff we're talking about here are not Sakai specific things. They are um, go to this link, right? So you, you would be looking at um, you'd be looking at this web page a whole lot, and and it's, it's as a developer, it's not too bad. It's pretty good documentation. As a as a as a normal user, this might be completely useless. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a mixed bag there. There's there's a ton, right? There's a ton of options that you can set in CK Editor. Um, this is a lot of them. This is, however, not uh, the same list as what are all the available toolbars I can turn on. That 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 does require a, a good bit more digging and. And I do have some more documentation I need to add to our file to make it easier for folks, right? Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to I'm going to add all of the tools back, and then just comment out most of them so that they're off by default. And then it'd be a lot easier for folks to just say, "Oh, actually, I want that one tool back on," and then you just uncomment that, and it and it's back on versus having to do a lot of discovery. So. So there, there are a couple of questions in the chat um, oh, that sure. I'll just sort of it. read out. <laughs> I mean, I, I can help or not if you don't want, but uh, well, uh, Charles asked. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Is, is I'll, I'll... All right, I'm shutting up now. I'm going away. No, I was just trying to say I'll, I'll get rid of the matrix effect and come back to here, and then you can read them to me. That's. I, I don't want to make people nauseous with that matrix. Big blue button. Okay, I'm, I'll read them. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, so Char Charles asks, is is this already incorporated? And if not, is there a timeline? It is not uh, incorporated. Um, it is going to be part of the the Duke build in the fall, and I'm going to do my best to get it into the 22 uh, release before the feature freeze. Uh, I have a little bit of work to do to, to get it ready. Um, it's uh, so I would say. Um, End of August for uh, 22 is the, is the date for the feature freeze there. I have not yet explored how back portable it is, but I uh, I think for the most part, it, it actually wouldn't be too bad to backport this to 21 or maybe even 20. So uh, that's that's definitely Earl's territory. But when I, you know, CK Editor is fairly static in how it uh, integrates with Sakai. And so we just upgrade the library Sakai doesn't care. It just looks at a new library. These config files are the same regardless. So if you're on Sakai 20 or 21, it may even be 
um, pretty easy to, to adopt this um, to an older version. Great, thank you. Um, Adam asks, if a user expands the C Canada bar, does that persist across sites, um, or does it have to be? No, no, that's a good. That, so the the thing we would need to do there is to is to cache that or add a user preference because I imagine some users would want to have it always open, right? And that's not that that was that was more work than I had time to do. I think that's a good feature to add to it, but I mean, you see, like even as soon as I refresh this page and stay on this page, right? I mean, it, it, it's going to collapse. That's the way it works currently. Um, uh, my, so our like, our rationale was we, we want to point people to the tools on this front row, right? We, we don't want people, one of the things I didn't talk about is all of the like custom text stuff is gone because we were hearing from students that all those text choices, they just get annoying. Faculty end up creating inaccessible text due to color choices and whatnot. So we want to point them to the stuff in the front row. I don't want to put things in the front row that aren't going to be used widely. Um, and I want people to use the stuff in the front row. We want them to use semantic markup. We want them you know, to use links and whatnot and, and bulleted lists. We don't want them doing other crazy stuff. And, um, and so the goal would be to find a front to define a top row here that that meets you know the 80% kind of kind of thing. I might want to consider moving templates up to the top row because a lot of people are using the templates now to format their text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a lot of good response from people about the templates. Yeah, I, I, I like the templates too. I think the templates combined with this format could be like format is just like mini templates almost, right? It's just one one tag, right? And then templates is like, well, actually you could do crazy stuff. You could you could do like 10 tags with one click. And so I think the two of those combined could really meet, meet a lot of needs. And then we could continue to expand them. One of the things I want to work on is, is a, this is an out of the box plugin that I'd like to customize that we could add stuff to it only accepts like eight tags right now and so i think we could we could make a lot better use of this if we could also define things like maybe i want to add an inline sakai banner you know or something like that and not have to have the um there's another one that's currently in our deployment called the uh, styles right and it has like 20 weird looking styles that also aren't sakai styles so that I've seen a lot of good feedback about the LaTeX changes, um, and I think Jennifer asked if you still need to turn it on in Site Info or not. Uh, no, no. So this is a completely separate implementation than our current implementation. So our current implementation would require you to turn on MathJax, and I guess that's something for the community to decide. There's a technical. Uh, you know, it's loading additional files into the editor to accomplish this work. And one of the things we did with our implementation was those files are never loaded if you don't check that box. Um, so this would just be an always on kind of thing. Um, it could maybe be refactored to also look for the checkbox in, in site info, but because we have the need here at Duke to, to just have this on, uh, we, we actually have that checkbox defaulted on in our sites now. So um, it, it just wasn't a need for us to, to think about that. Um, so yeah, this would, this would work in a site that doesn't even have the current math jacks on. That would mean that, you know, the, the dollar sign one, right? That, that would no longer work. That would just look like this. It wouldn't get rendered to anything. Um, but this one would actually work. Oop, overrode my stuff. And I can demo that if we want to take the next question. I'll just um, give you. Josh, you had a question about Slack type linking. Was that with the auto linking or is that something different? Yeah, that's related to the auto linking. So I mean, my, my question, I, one of the things that I, I love in Slack is that you can select a word, paste a URL on it, and the word gets linked to that URL. And it's it's very, you know, it's it's few clicks and it's very functional. And I was just kind of curious, Michael, whether the, the auto linking that these enhancements now supports does that 
or whether that's still something for the future. Let me see. We will. Um, so there you go. That's. Oh no, I guess I. I take it back. It does require. Oh. Glad you asked that question. So there you go. It does require that to be turned on. Um, let's edit this. And so what you're saying is, if I want to uh, grab the URL. Select text. I don't think that's how it works, right? So it, it out of the box, the plugin pastes in the, the text. So um, I mean, this is this is definitely a step click. forward. I just thought yeah, I, I yeah. was just seeking to clarify. Yeah, that, that again, that's probably doable. Um, what you know, the, you always have to draw the line between: do we want to uh, in the in the dev world, it's called fork. We do, do we want to copy this out of the box plugin? make changes and then own those changes or do we just leave it as is and and leverage what we're given by CK editor so um, there's, it's always a dance one question on Josh's question is that control K is supported in Outlook web access to insert a hyperlink so I know that control I is supported for italics etc can you control K in order to bring up the link dialog again so yeah. It's a keyboard shortcut, but if you have text highlighted and you want to insert a hyperlink for that text, hit Control-K. Yeah, that works. There you go. I think I'm about at time, Wilma. Is that is that right? Um, yeah, I had budgeted 20 minutes, but we can go over if there's additional questions. If not, we can move on. Let's see. Oh, Adam's just giving us more keyword <laughs> <laughs> tips. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate you um, demoing that for us and working on it. Um, that's that's a nice. Uh, Nice thing to have in the next coming release. So that's going to be some exciting change that will appear to users throughout the interface. So it's it's going to be very visible throughout Sakai um, since it's in the editor that shows up everywhere. So um, yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be a big change. Yeah. So very nice. Cool. Cheers, folks. I have to drop off to another meeting, but um, you know, Prof. Mike Green, if you need to find me on any of this. Stuff, any any place I want to be found, feel free to email me there. Or um... all right, great, thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Okay, um, so we have. Um, let me grab presenter back. We have about half an hour left, and so we'll take the the remainder of our time to talk about. A few JIRAs. I do have a few in the list. Um, there were some that carried over, and I'm not sure, Charles, maybe you know if you got to any of those last time. Um, they were in the parking lot section, and I just copied the Etherpad. So. We did not. Okay, great. Um, so let me just, I added a few that were kind of in backlog that I'd gotten through email. And I'm glad that Christina is here because one of them was forwarded to me by Sean. Um, but I think Christina, you were the one that had um, questions about it. So I'm going to pull that one up first. That is, it's a tests and quizzes item. Um, it's Sakai 45657. And it's about deleting and restoring with modified rubric. Christina, do you want to walk us through that one a little bit, if you recall what the um, question was? I, I was working on updating the test scripts for part of tests and quizzes. Samago is a pain in the butt. Rubrics is a pain in the butt. Combine both, and I was going a little crazy. <laughs> so I discovered probably a very fringe use case but it's not at all consistent between versions and what's going on. 
if you create a test that's using rubrics for questions and then delete that test, draft and or published, the rubric, if it's not used for any other questions, becomes um, unlocked. That's expected. If you restore that test, it brings back the rubrics. The rubric under the tool is locked again for normal. But if in that window, while the test is deleted, before you restore it, you can go in, completely modify the rubric, and then what's it supposed to do when that test is restored? And that's the question. In some it uses, in one case I found it used the modified rubric even for a graded test, in others it uh, picked a completely different rubric from the list of rubrics in that site. Yeah, that's a sticky one. Does it, what does assignments do? Yeah. Uh, I do not know. I did not uh, try this particular. Yeah, because whatever it does, it should work the same way in both tools. Um, but I don't know how assignments handles that either. I'd have to go test it. I'm trying that real quick right now, just because now I'm curious. I mean, ideally, you would want the, the original rubric to kind of stay unmodified, I would think. Um, but Adam, how are you going to how are you going to track that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and do you, is it different if there's submissions that are graded using the rubric versus no submissions? Yeah, that would be really messy to track deleted stuff. I mean, it seems like once you deleted it, you didn't have to worry about it anymore. That would be true if we could not restore deleted things, but <laughs> yeah. now that we can. Are there any opinions on the desired workflow there? Um, in some ways, I think it kind of depends on whether there are already submissions or not. Because, I mean, I would think that if there were not submissions, then it should shift to using the modified rubric. If there were already submissions, uh, what if they were graded submissions already? That's a mess. Yeah. I wish Adrian was on the call. He could probably tell us what's messier <laughs> on the back end. It looks like assignments, if it has no submissions, um, just switches to using the, mo the modified rubric. I haven't tested it with submissions. Jennifer, I did in my testing keep it with the same name just to make life easier. I did not try changing the name. But I did try adding and removing ratings and criteria, so I completely changed the stuff. I wonder if maybe it would just pick up the new rubric and if there were graded submissions, give a, a message to the instructor saying, this rubric has been modified. You need to regrade. 
and hopefully they didn't create a whole bunch and delete by accident. Well, if they, at least, if, yeah. they, if they don't modify the rubric, it restores everything just fine. This is this only comes up if during that time it's deleted. Right. The instructor goes and changes the rubric completely around. Right. What I'm saying is if, if the rubric is modified and they try to restore, that it could somehow alert, <clears throat> excuse me, alert the user saying, hey, this rubric is different from when you deleted this test. If there's any um, submissions associated with it, you'll probably need to regrade them. Everybody's really quiet. <laughs> do we want to vote um, or do we want to just like say we couldn't reach consensus? It's, it, let's see, there's three um, expected results that Christina lists in the, in the JIRA itself. Use a modified rubric, reset the question to not use a rubric, or prevent the rubric from being modified. Um, For my part, I would not want three because that could create problems if you delete yeah, it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want three because preventing the rubric from being modified for a trashed test and quiz, you would then have to purge the ta trashed test and quiz or create an entirely new rubric. So I can't see that being the path of least resistance. Right. It, it seems to be resetting. It oh, I'm sorry, Christina. I was just going to say, I just quick was testing assignments. It looks like for assignments, it uses the modified rubric. And if any of the criterion that were already graded is modified, it just resets that one to being blank. That particular row on the rubric for a graded student. It sh it'd be better if it gave it a warning, but it at least it behaves what I would consider intelligently in, in, in assignments. Yeah, I, I, I would... I would follow the assignments pattern on that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think so too, because especially if you're keeping the rubric with the same name and you're just tweaking it, it should just pick up by name, correct? If it's doing that in assignments. It seems to pick it up by rubric ID because I did change mm -hmm. I, assignments. I was changing the name of the rubric too. Oh, okay. So I would vote for use a modified rubric and reset any criteria that have changed so they have to be regraded. I'd agree with that. Anybody else? Any dissenting opinions? All right, I will take silence to mean agreement. <laughs> so speak up if, if you disagree. I'll put a note on this JIRA um, saying that, that we, uh, the group agreed that, uh, that that's the behavior that we would expect. So hopefully um, this can be changed so that it's, it's in alignment with the way assignments does it. All right, great. And thank you for, for finding that edge case there, <laughs> Christina. That's definitely a... One that um, you wouldn't normally think to test for, but I'm glad that you did. So um, you were definitely being thorough in your testing, which appreciated. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Um, this is one of Tiffany. As you'll see, there's a bunch from Tiffany. She When she finds a JIRA that's particularly thorny, she usually puts it in the teaching and learning Slack channel so we tend to get a lot of them from her um so I, I don't think she's here today so hopefully this isn't one that she wanted to talk about specifically but um 
see, this is a CMAGO, um, also tests and quizzes um, issue. Let me paste that into the chat in case you guys want to look at it. Let's see here. Instructor can no longer intentionally use consecutive spaces or non-breaking spaces as part of the answer text in fill in the blank question. Okay. Um, there's a very detailed test plan. I'm going to close that out for the moment. All right. So when the instructor enables the CK editor intentionally includes two consecutive spaces, um, always marked incorrect. Okay. Looks like it was it was tied to some that were closed. I'm wondering if this has been handled somewhere else. I think those were older. Yeah. Is where it was kind of going back and forth as to what might have caused it. Okay. Um, so does anyone um, have an opinion on what the desired behavior should be? It looks like there's no comments yet on this particular JIRA. Um, do you know of folks that like to include consecutive spaces as part of an answer? Is that something we need to count for? I know when I looked at this issue in triage, I was thinking normally if my instructors have two spaces in the answer, it's because they typoed and did not intend that. I've not had any of my instructors ever try to do that deliberately. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's wondering why why are you gonna put consecutive spaces in there? And she doesn't say why they wanted to do it. She just says that they wanted to. Um, so I guess I would want to understand a little bit more about the use case. Anybody else with a thought on that one? I, I think I may kick this one back to Tiffany for more info. Um, maybe she can elaborate on why the two consecutive spaces are needed. All right, so we will move on to the next one. Um, this one, yeah, this is a feature request um, for Gradebook. This was one that came up in as well. And I remember Tiffany and I were chatting about this last week. So she had an instructor who wanted to use um, specifications grading. And so if you're not familiar with specifications grading, um, she put some links in here about how it works. Um, it's sort of an alternative grading practice. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here. But uh, basically, it's, it's sort of a pass-fail or satisfactory, unsatisfactory kind of grading. Um, but at the end of the day, it still needs to map to a letter grade for um, you know, grades to be uh, communicated back to the registration system. Um, so in order to send those grades, end-of-term grades, back to the registrar, it needs to map to a grade scale. And so um, there were some issues she was encountering in setting up the grade book so that the, the grade scale would map correctly. Um, so I'm just curious to know if any of your faculty are using this type of grading, um, if you've encountered these sorts of issues before, if you have any thoughts on them.
Feels like I'm talking a lot today, but we haven't had anyone try to use that. The closest we've come is instructors who want to do like an all or nothing for points. Um, but that's really just a matter of, you know, creating a gradebook item worth whatever the appropriate weight is. And then when you're grading it, choosing to give only, you know, 100% or nothing. Right. Yeah, I think she has, I don't know if she put it in here. One of the options we had suggested, if it's kind of a pass-fail sort of setting for each assignment, then maybe they could just be a zero or a one because the gradebook only accepts numbers. Um, should the gradebook accept pass-fail, I guess, is a bigger question. Um, I know that assignments you can grade pass-fail. Um, but it's only within the assignments. So this is something that we want to think about for the centralized grading service. Um, is that pass-fail grading something we need to make sure that the gradebook can support? Okay, so Jennifer says she has a pass-fail assignment and just adjusts the points as extra credit, but they don't count um, in the total grade in the gradebook. Okay, Adam says that he doesn't think instructors have requested this at his institution. Charles, how about in Illinois State? Have you run into this at all? I was just trying to remember. I think we have had some interest in, in sort of non-traditional grading in various aspects. I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head at the moment, but um, I mean, being able to do something besides just points, I think, is certainly something that's desirable. Um, I guess my question would be if something like that was, if pass-fail was implemented, um, would it be something that's set up for an individual item, or is it set up where the whole gradebook, all items are pass-fail? Seems like there's a couple different ways you could go with that. Yeah, it does seem like it it would get a little trickier if you had items that were some of them were pass fail and others were just numeric. Um, you'd have to make sure that the pass fail ones fell in the appropriate spot in the grading scheme. Um, if the whole grade book was pass fail though, then that would be, I think, a little easier, um, at least the logistics of it. Yeah, I'm just not sure that that would take a lot of, of thinking about different use cases and scenarios of, of how people might want to use something like that to really figure out how, how you would want to implement it. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to do some more discovery there and find out, you know, maybe interview a few people that are using this kind of grading and find out the types of things that they're doing with it or that they would like to do with it um, mm -hmm. and then bring that information back and uh, inform this JIRA a little bit more. All right. Well, if there's no other thoughts on that one, I will um, see if I can gather some more information and we'll come back to this one at a later date. Um, when hopefully we will have more information to go on as far as making a determination about features. It's kind of hard to map out the features until you know exactly what the 
user case is. So, um, all right. Let's see. We've got eight minutes. Do you want to try one more, Jira, or do you want to just um, end a little bit early today? Jennifer says, let's try one more. Okay. That was, okay, so this one is um, also Sam ago. And it's about removing behavior of forcibly submitting untimed assessments when auto submit is not enabled. Um, so it looks like This may already, it looks, well, it's resolved. So I don't know if it's been added in, but it, it should be in 22. Um, looks like the um, unsubmitted assessments were being <clears throat> submitted anyway, even though auto submit wasn't turned on. So um, they want to be able to leave them unsubmitted unless auto submit is enabled. Um, so that, that seems pretty straightforward. And I would imagine that um, it's probably still being tested, but if it's already resolved in 22, then it would be something to, to merge back if possible. Um, does anybody have a different opinion on this uh, behavior here? It looks like it's a regression, actually, because it used to work and now it doesn't. I see Jennifer typing. Does this resolve the in-progress tests? I believe that it does. If, if it's an unsubmitted assessment, it would show up as in-progress to the instructor. But the instructor can't get those, so we usually have to go in and push them through on the admin panel. That's why I'm wondering. But our job runs every morning too, so if there are any, it does auto submit. Yeah, so it wouldn't it wouldn't change the behavior of the ones that are being auto submitted intentionally. It's just if someone has has chosen to not enable auto submit. Um, they don't want to auto submit. It won't. It won't do them. them. Oh, I got right. you. Right. Right. Yeah, Christina seems like it's a no no debate issue. I would agree. I think this seems pretty straightforward. So I'll I'll mark that one after the call that we um, we agreed with this uh, quest. Oh, bye. Bye, Adam. Thanks for joining us. All right. Well, we've only got five minutes left, but I think um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So let me move the other ones to our parking lot. Actually, didn't get to today. We'll get to them next time. Um, our next meeting is August 4th. Um, I don't think we have anything particular on the agenda, so if anybody has any suggestions for something that they would like to discuss or a demo they would like to see or maybe they want to volunteer <laughs> to demo something, that would be great. Um, so let me know if you have any thoughts about August 4th um, or let Charles know, and um, either of us will be happy to put you on the agenda for next time. So thanks everybody for joining us today and have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Bye-bye.